Hi, welcome to Flosky. We ask scientists and experts to break down popular movie scenes related to science. Hi, I'm Hector Bjorklund and I'm a particle physicist. So today we're watching Good Will Hunting. It's a really good movie and uh, we're going to analyze the math problem scene um, where Will, the Good Will, um, he's, um, he's making the math problem come true. So let's see. Without further ado, come forward, silent rogue, and receive thy prize. Ah, oh, ha, ha, yeah, okay. So that's a co common uh, combinatoric problem, which I first got into contact when I was in uni. Uh, so if we now draw on the board right here. Um, so the basic rules we have are that you can not conjoin these what we call harmonious objects, um, and you can see them by the points and crosses. Um, then we have two lines can be parallel to each other, and there can only be eight points in a single figure. So let me draw a couple of them to you, there are ten in total. Um, so these are strands, you can see, and uh, those are harmonious points, and these are ordinary um, epsilon points. Uh, these strands connect through here, but remember, they can't be parallel to each other. This specific figure right here, the seventh of the ten, is used binarily to figure out the weight of protons and antiprotons in a subdimensional space. Um, the ninth one is the most complicated one. Um, its uses haven't been figured out really yet, but it's believed that they have to do with dark matter and dark energy. Um, so the basic formula for conjoining these different figures is as following. So it's an integral and derivative formula um, where j of x represents the indefinite value of a given point in space measured in units of transverse uh, gravitational force and kelvins. Uh, a transverse gra gravitational force is basically a force that is measured inside the cores of atoms, say quarks. And um, so this formula is der derived to a specific extent from which it is then antiderivated, for example, integrated um, back uh, to a specific extent. So it provides a indefinite constant, as you know, if you if you um, integrate something, it will give you the C. Um, and this indefinite constant um, represents essentially um, the figure. So, so the figure that, that are drawn right here, they can represent different um, uh, sets of values that we can see in the finite space of the human eye. Um, and um, this is something used in uh, theoretical physics a lot. And my brother, Fabian Bjorklund, he's a theoretical ph physicist, he's going to explain it to you now. Oh, hi, didn't see you there. I was asked by my good colleagues, oh, I'm Fabian Bjorklund, theoretical physicist, PhD, MFD, DHD, DPD. Um, I was asked by my colleagues in Finland to explain the quantum splitting of the endangered atom to you guys. So, Basically, how it happens is a tuberculoid of the quantum quark inside of the left ventricle of the hydrogen atom is what makes it really happen, okay? And when I say what makes it really happen, let me explain to you. Imagine this is your endangered atom, and this is your unendangered atom. What happens is the quark tape with the muons inside comes and it splits them together, such as this. They become merged per se, although here it didn't work, which is another quantum entanglement issue. Get out of here, all right? Wait, I need my Turks to do so. All right, oh, and you can imagine this is a prion stream. So the prion stream, it comes and it goes like this. All over it. And bang, here comes your endangered. <laughs> the unendangered atom has broken. And let me explain to you why it happens. The endangerer, what it does is it splits open the quion inside of the tip and it makes this. You hear this? That's what happens. That's what happens. It comes, to, it comes back in and it reattaches. And blows out some of the prior stream out of the endangered atom. And this is how the endangered atom becomes. A dead atom. The quantum endangerment levels have gone up hugely, which means that the no death. Explosion.
explodes. It yeah. blows up on telling you, it blows up, just like the endangered atom. But the thing is, it's an anti-particle, an anti-process even. So when you go into the splitting, I'm talking the H splitting with the double slit thing, Young's modulus, Young's modulus comes in and it tests the strength of the bond. And when I'm talking about the bond, the important part, the whole part is about the bond. Now this bond, what it does after the atom is split, it puts it back together as a quartified state. The prion team mm -hmm. comes back in and boom, it's gone. I hope that explained it very well. Uh, I'll give you back to my colleagues in wherever the fuck now. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you very much. Today we're going to watch some scenes from the movie Martian. I love this scene because it tries to mimic the movements of human in space, but it makes no sense if you consider the aerodynamic properties of a uh, astronaut. When he punctures his suit, he is trying to make a thruster, but he's only using one hand. The problem with that is when he has a propulsion in only one hand, he needs to put it in his direct line of his Y axis. As you know, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. This means if his hand is only on the left side, he's gonna start spinning, but he doesn't, right? You can see his movement. In reality, he would spin out of control and he would actually die. Interstellar, going to the black hole. So in this scene, Cooper goes in the black hole after he has to leave the mothership. The physics in this scenario are very plausible because when you crush the event horizon, the gravitation gets exponentially stronger. At the center of a black hole, as described by general relativity, may lie a gravitational singularity, a region where the space-time curvature becomes infinite. You will be pulled harder and harder to the core of the black hole until you are a line of atoms getting split into two. This continues to the molecular level until you get out the other end. The particle properties of the matter become apparent when we measure its position velocity. The wave properties of matter become apparent when we measure its wave properties and interference. The wave particle duality feature is incorporated in the relation of coordinates and operators in the formulation of quantum mechanics. Since the matter is free, not subject to any interactions, the quantum state can be represented as a wave of arbitrary shape and extending over space as a wave function. The position and momentum of the particle are observables. The uncertainty principle states that the position and the momentum cannot simultaneously be measured with complete precision. However, one can measure the position alone of a moving free particle creating an eigenstate of position with a wave function that is very large, a uh, direct delta, at a particular position x, and zero everywhere else. If one, per, uh, if one performs a position measurement on such a wave function, the resultant x will be obtained with a 100% probability. This is called an eigenstate of position, or stated in mathematical terms, a generalized, generalized position eigenstate or Eigen distribution. If the particle is in an Eigen state of position, then its momentum is completely unknown. On the other hand, if the particle is in an Eigen state of momentum, then its position is completely unknown. In an Eigen state of momentum having a plane waveform, it can be shown that the wavelength is actually equal to h over p, where h is Planck's constant and p is the momentum of the Eigen state. Hi, my name is Thomas Petro and I'm a nuclear physicist. There is no core. It exploded! The core exploded! What we are witnessing right now is something that occurs as a result of the rapid release of energy from high-speed musical. The driving reaction may be nuclear fission or nuclear fusion, or a multi-stage cascading combination of the two, though to date all fusion-based weapons have a used fission device to initiate fusion. And a pure fusion weapon remains a hypothetical device. You know, when the whole nuclear station is overheating and every atom on a molecular, molecular level is reducing the range of their atomic demonstration, this basically means that uh, the nuclear fusion is the reaction that releases atomic energy by the union of light nucleol at high temperatures to form heavier atoms. Uh, hydrogen bombs, again, which use nuclear fusion, have a higher destructive power and greater efficiency than atomic bombs. Due to high temperatures required, uh, to initiate a nuclear fusion reaction, the process is often referred to as a thermonuclear explosion. 
This is typically done with the isotopes of hydrogen, deuterium and tritium, which fuse together to form helium atoms. Yes, thank you. That was all. Thank you for joining us today.